Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center, home of the Tina Turner Museum. Emily, and welcome everybody to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emily, before I introduce today's special guest, what is something you have discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? This week, I discovered that according to estimates, the world population will grow by nearly 30% to almost 10 billion people by 2050. And that's why it is so important that we apply new tools and technology and experiment with new ideas about raising plants and animals in our agriculture. And where did you discover that fascinating fact? Well, I discovered that from our um, agriculture exhibit in the Simmons Bank Ag Center, but I was doing some research on our guest and decided to dig a little more into agriculture innovation and found out these statistics. And that is what Discovery Park of America is all about, getting people to get interested and deciding to dig a little more. Um, Our guest today is Roger Sorkin. Roger is an award-winning filmmaker and executive director of the American Resilience Project. Welcome, Roger. Thank you very much, Scott. Good to be with you. Before we jump into uh, one of the reasons you're here is you, you're the director of the film Farm Free or Die, which will be you know shown here during um, um, our um, Ag Day. Uh, but first of all, let's back up a little bit. I'm curious, uh, where'd you come from um, and um, how, how, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Long Island, New York. Uh, not many farms where I, I grew up. There, there were a lot of farms, but they were... Uh, they had a lot of uh, suburban cul-de-sac neighborhoods built over them um, by the time I came along in the early 70s. Um, and so I didn't really have much exposure to agriculture until uh, later in life. And uh, for me, it's still been a, an ongoing learning process. I've learned a great deal uh, with regards to this process of making this new film. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I was a suburban kid, grew up outside New York City. Um, and uh, don't consider myself uh, city material anymore because I, I now live in Western Massachusetts, which actually does have a fair amount of smaller farms. And uh, once you taste the uh, open space of an area like the one I live in now, I don't know that anyone could go back to the city. I certainly can't. Now you're a you're a filmmaker now. Um, were you the kid that was running around with the video camera and uh, making videos for fun? I, you know, I was, my grandfather was one of the first adopters of uh, one of those clunky VHS video recording systems. And I remember going on family trips with not only him carrying this camera around, but he also had the, uh, the recording device that you'd sling over your shoulder. So I, I would, I would tote all, all these, these bits of equipment around for him to record a really low quality image on a VHS tape. Um, and he gave me my first still camera and I wound up doing a lot of, uh, audio documentaries, uh, with my family when I was a kid interviewing my grandmother and what she was making for dinner and, um, other kinds of things that, uh, you know, you wouldn't really want to take the time to have to listen through, but, uh, it, it gave me a, a real appre- appreciation of, of storytelling and learning how to interact with, with, uh, people in conversation. It was, um, uh, definitely a, a family uh, family experience that, uh, that that inspired me to go down this career path. Now, here's what worries me. So I was, the, you know, in kind of the same boat you were in. I ended up with, you know, maybe 150 VHS tapes because I loved videoing and my mom videoed, so I got some of her videotapes. And then I converted them all to digital, put them in the cloud, you know, because VHS tapes are obviously degrading at this point. Um, And so now I have all this wealth of really, you know, moments in our lives. But nowadays, you know, everybody's putting everything on their phone. And I'm worried a lot of people are not putting them in the cloud. So a lot of that history, I'm worried, is just going to vanish someday. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you know, we're, we we generate so much more media and information these days. It's I've almost given up on trying to catalog it all. I mean, I've got my my prized family videos. When my kids were small, and you know, some of the stuff I have of my grandparents, my parents, um, digitizing that stuff, and um, you know, backing it up in a couple of places. I, I send one one drive to my parents' house, so they've got one, <laughs> um, and I've got another one here, but. You know, this it was a years long process of just taking all this old 16 millimeter film and slides. And, um, you know, it's it's a family treasure to have this sort of thing. Um, and uh, it's just it's hard to keep up with it because, you know, in the old days, you take you take pictures, you'd get 24 exposures. Uh, and uh, nowadays people go out and, you know, one afternoon they're taking like 300 pictures with their smartphone and then then. <laughs> You know, as a filmmaker, I think about this, the more material you acquire, the more time you're going to need to sift through it to find all the things you're going to wind up using in your in your finished project. So I, I actually like to think about the final story and what that final version is going to look like before I start taking the picture. So I don't wind up with reams and reams of, of material, you know, m- more more chaff than wheat, if you will. Um, it's, it's never a good, good uh good problem to have when you're, you're, you know, you can't find the wheat through all that. Well, I've got all of my children's, you know, photographs from when they were little and videos on a removable hard drive in my house. And then I have the URL written on it and the password so that, you know, hopefully evolve though, both of those ways, some, maybe something will survive me um, for my uh, descendants to be able to, to take advantage of. Um, yeah. so when, when a, a time came for you to go to college, uh, which uh, path did you take? Well, it's funny. I, uh, I thought I was going to be a doctor and, uh, I applied to Johns Hopkins, uh, pre-med program. And it took me about two weeks to figure out that that's, that was the wrong idea after getting into college and going, um, at that point I, uh, sort of drifted between different disciplines and finally found my way to anthropology which I, I say was a really great foundation for the kind of work that I do now. It, it, uh, it led into a career in journalism and then ultimately uh, video and filmmaking. And it really set me up to, to understand how to tell stories about worlds and cultures and people from different walks of life who I don't understand or that I never had any experience or exposure to. I mean, you know, it's a good example. I, I grew up in the suburbs of New York. Uh, again, not having any exposure to, to farmers and farming and, you know, only knowing about farming, what I knew from TV or stereotypes. And, um, you know, I think having a background in anthropology helps you learn to think about how you approach different, different folks from, from different walks of life. And so when I set out to make this particular film, you know, we were filming on location in Tennessee and Nebraska, um, Interestingly, COVID precluded my visiting those places. So we relied upon some of the farmers that are in the film to actually do the filming for us, um, which was an entirely different exercise altogether. But it it allowed for even more authenticity, I think, on the part of some of the speakers, because they were speaking to their spouses in some cases who were holding a, a camera. You know, I would be on FaceTime or Zoom asking questions, but the person they were looking at was someone they already knew. Who, who, who knew them and understood them. Uh, and it, it, I think it helped actually break down uh, a, even a little bit more, you know, sometimes, even though when I go into do an interview, I uh, try to be as respectful as I can be to understand I'm a guest in someone else's home. Um, you know, whether I, even if I'm not in their actual house, you know, I, I know that they're, they're being gracious and giving me, they're sharing their time and their thoughts and their feelings with me. Um, there's only so much authenticity you can get out of just being a stranger though in their lives. And so when you have folks that they know who they already trust that are actually asking the questions and doing the filming, it, it allowed for even more authenticity, I think uh, on camera. Um, but, you know, going back to your question about what I, what I studied and uh, how I, I set out on this path, I'd say if anybody's interested in a, a career in documentary filmmaking, don't skip out on a, a good social science education, whether that's anthropology or psychology, or, or, uh, or social or sociology. Yeah, I actually have one daughter who has a degree in sociology and the other one almost has a degree in psychology. So, um, I don't know what that says about my child rearing, uh, skills (laughs) there, (laughs) but they've both gone down, down those paths. Um, 
So, uh, spoiler alert, you're going to end up founding an organization called the American Resilience Project that harnesses the power of strategic narratives to address our greatest threats to human security and civilizational stability. So, at what point did you start, uh, did it start raising in your mind some of these threats that you're seeing and you decided to try to tackle them using uh, documentaries? You know, I think it started around the, this debate about climate change. You know, I, I had always been somewhat frustrated about how, how what I thought shouldn't be a, a political issue became very politicized. Um, and, you know, it seemed to me more, you know, we, we spent too much time debating whether or not the cause of climate change was man-made or it wasn't. I mean, I think that the science is pretty clear that, uh, you know, even if the, the earth has been going through these warming and cooling cycles for, for millions of years, and it has, um, you know, long before human beings <laughs> walked the earth, um, it's pretty clear that the, the way we use energy and the way we extract our energy is having an effect on uh, on the climate uh, in a way that is is just doing harm to us. You know, I, I don't I try not to get too sentimental about the earth necessarily. I I think I might be maybe uh, more focused on just humanity. Um, you know, I've put it into selfish terms. I mean, if I had to pick a species that I want to see continue on this planet, I'd, I'd say I want humans to continue, and you know, all the other ones can can get in line behind us. If, uh, you know, as long as their demise doesn't affect our demise, and certainly there are a lot of interconnections <laughs> between us and the other species, so we certainly don't want them to go away. Um, but I, I, I think that the way it becomes more relatable to people is when they can think about it in, in terms of their own daily lives and their own basic human needs. And it's too abstract for most folks to, to feel something, um, you know, they have to feel something because polar bears are not able to... Uh, survive as easily. I mean, it's hard to make that case to someone who's struggling with two jobs, uh, you know, single parent, you know, whatever. Everybody, there are a lot of folks struggling economically. If you're going to get them to care about anything, you got to put it in terms that, that are going to affect them. I think it, it's not selfish to say what's in it for me. I think it's just human nature. I think if we want to inspire people to make changes in their lives and, and support certain policies or not support certain policies. You have to make it tangible and real to them, and it's it, that kind of. You, you talked about this, uh, the idea of the st strategic narrative, and I think about that uh, for all the work that we do. You know, I define a strategic narrative narrative as a story that unites the greatest number of people as you can possibly unite around something that they can relate to in their daily lives, and I think. The, the emphasis on your daily life is really key. You know, if you're not talking about how this affects people's jobs or their pocketbooks or the health of their families and their safety of their homes and neighborhoods, um, then you're, you're losing them. You know, that, that lets the issue get maybe too politicized. Um, I think the way to depoliticize a lot of the, the challenges that we face is to just put it into basic human need. You know, that's, and that's, that's what a good story can do is, is, is frame it in that way. Um, so for me, it, it really started, I think I started thinking about film along these lines about 11 years ago now, when I came across the military's quadrennial defense review uh, document they put out every four years just to, to sort of take stock. I, mean, I, I describe it as a kind of state of the union from the military perspective and taking stock of how they're, they're doing in terms of executing the national strategy um, and where we need to be decades down the road to maintain our, our position as a, as a secure nation. They talked about climate change as a threat multiplier in that document. And when I saw that phrase, it really jumped out at me. Um, and I, I think as far as for storytellers sake, well, if we describe things as a threat multiplier, uh, I think that grabs your attention. You know, you can see how you get, get dots are connected now, right? Like, uh, you know, sea level rises somewhere um, where lots of people are living and their homes are flooded. Um, and then there's instability in that region. And then food and water supplies become more, more scarce. There's going to be conflict. Um, and the military saw that because clearly, you know, at least, at least 11 years ago, maybe a little less so now, 
I mean, we were still very much going around the world to put out fires wherever they need to be, even in just terms of humanitarian efforts. I mean, the military does a lot of humanitarian relief after storms, hurricanes. You know, we're, we're always getting these disaster relief requests, requests from around the world. Um, and so they saw that it was a burden on their own resources and their own capacity to achieve the missions that they've been told to achieve. Um, but because they were responding so much to environmental and, and climate related disasters, uh, they saw that as a, an unfortunate opportunity cost and they were trying to ring the bell on that. So I wanted to help step up and help them ring that bell. Um, you know, I think when we can put climate in terms of national security, it becomes more accessible to people. Um, you know, again, if we're talking about the sage grouse, maybe it's not as accessible to people. But, you know, when we talk about it in, in terms of how we're all going to pay more as taxpayers or we're going to disproportionately uh, lose, especially, you know, across uh, the South and the Midwest, where we, we see more um, young people go into the military than from other regions in the country. Um, you know, we don't want people to be injured or die unnecessarily in military uh, through military efforts if we can prevent it. And I think that was the key is just putting this in terms of blood and treasure, saving lives, saving taxpayer money. That's what it's all about. And that's how we can take down some of the political temperature around uh, some of these issues. So Luke, who's our producer here, is also a very talented uh, videographer. He and I may at some point decide we want to do a documentary together. So uh, walk me through just a little bit of the process that someone like yourself, an award-winning documentarian, uh, when you start off, you know, where do you start and what's the process that allows you to end up with such award-winning work? Oh, that's, it's interesting. You know, I know, I know the answer is different for a lot of people. I mean, there are a lot of filmmakers who would consider themselves to be artists first and, I make no judgment about that. I think that's perfectly fine. So that means if you're interested in a particular story that you think the world needs to hear, go out and tell that story. And that's a beautiful thing. That's, that's, that's art at its best. Um, there's another line of filmmakers I, I would consider myself to be in the, this, this other line, which consider themselves to be activists first, that they want to see a change in the world. And then they think, well, okay, we've got to tell some stories to, to realize that change. Um, I try to start with what is the, the change that, that I think is most practical? What is, you know, I think about political considerations. I think about public policy. I uh, think about culture, um, perceptions that, that people might have that, that, that might be, you know, correct or incorrect. And, and how do you, how do you address and meet people where they are when it comes to the way they see the world? You know, you can't just uh, ask Al Gore to be the spokesperson for climate related issues everywhere in the country. I mean, it's just, it comes down to who's the trusted messenger. You know, he's not going to be, you know, you go into like the reddest part of the reddest state you know, they're going to say, get out of here, Al Gore. <laughs> they don't care what he has to say. It's not his fault. Uh, it's just that he's identified with a particular political brand. Um, and I think having people who are very closely related to political brands, wherever they are in the political spectrum, are not the best messengers when it comes to uniting people across the political spectrum. So I think a lot about politics and culture before I, I set out to, to make these films. So, you know, in this, this new film, Farm Free or Die, we, we wanted to, to try to, A, like we ask ourselves a question, what is the change we want to see in the world? Um, there's so many ways to answer that question. I think in this particular case, number one, we want to see improved livelihoods in farming communities and, and connecting the dots there. Um, well, why is that important? Well, you know, farmers, they produce our food for us. Um, we all eat food. So therefore, if farmers are struggling, you can, you can infer that the food supply might be a little bit stressed. Um, you know, we want to give farmers the, the best opportunity to make a living, to be healthy while they're making that living, to give their kids a path to continue that work, um, to even give kids a path who don't come from farming families to get into farming, because that's a problem in, in far, farming uh, communities as well. It's uh, some of the people in our film told us, you know, you don't get into farming unless you're born into it or you marry into it. And that shouldn't be the case. 
um, it limits a lot of talent that that could go into what I think is a really vital profession. So, you know, another person might have answered that question to say, well, you know, what we want to see is a world where uh, climate change isn't a problem and all the carbon is removed from the atmosphere. That, I have to say, is one of the other goals of a film like this. We want to see less carbon in, in the atmosphere. And we know that soil is a great way to absorb that carbon. So, but, but we know that if we're trying to get the buy-in of folks who you know, are in farming communities, you know, they, they need to see a pathway to make money on that. You can't just go in and mandate and say, like, okay, we're the government. We're telling you now you have to do uh, your farming in a way that's going to capture carbon. And these are the things you're allowed to do. And these are the things you're not allowed to do. It, it doesn't work very well when you do it that way. And I think if, if we can illuminate a path to show farmers how you make money on this, and yeah, you do need some policy that's going to maybe establish the guideposts for marketplaces and, and uh, incentives in, uh, in the space, uh, then we'll get more buy-in. Uh, and then we don't have to worry about it being such a, a political issue. If people see an improvement in their daily lives, and they say, wow, the government's paying me or this carbon market is paying me to plant cover crops uh, eight months out of the year when I'm not growing a cash crop. Um, that's, that's the way we, we go about it. So when we figure out the, the, the change we want to see, we figure out the politics and, and, and we have this whole calculus around how we get from here to there to achieve that change, then we go back and say, OK, where are we going to film? Who are the people that are going to be in the film? What are the questions we're going to ask them? And then we start filming. Um, I think that that might be somewhat of an anomalous process for other filmmakers. You know, I've seen a lot of, of what I consider to be inefficient use of time and money going out and doing all this, this filming and, and making a what by all accounts is a, a well-made film. Um, but then when the film is released, the impact that it has, there, there tends to often be a, a, a disconnect in, in terms of is it really achieving the change that you're trying to achieve or are you just preaching to the choir or, or, you, or are you in an echo chamber or are you that tree that's falling in the forest and nobody hears? Uh, it's sad to see a lot of filmmakers go down that road. And, and I vowed when I started to do my own independent work that I wasn't going to go down that road. I was going to make sure I talked to people who are in the know and, and, and really understood the, this whole process before we even put our hands on the camera. How do you how do you gain the trust of the people that you want uh, to interview when you know they're very different than you from you know where they grew up and maybe their political affiliations or whatever? How do you uh, gain their trust enough to where they'll open up and give you both their time and you know put themselves on camera for you? Well, you know it's important, and um, you know again I, I go back to that uh, the anthropology lessons that I learned. Right, like you have to have to show up with a lot of humility for one thing, uh, knowing that you don't know. Uh, you know, again, you're a guest in their home, and I think for for stories like this, I mean, I don't consider myself a journalist. Um, I do practice what I consider to be the ethics of journalism, but because I'm not a journalist, I don't have any problem with the, the subjects of our stories having editorial control. Um, you know, good journalists will not let their subjects have editorial control. I mean, a, an egregious, egregious example of that would be if you, you know, if you interviewed like the, you know, the governor of your state, and then you let the governor kind of edit the video to make him or herself look good. Um, you know, that, that would be wrong, <laughs> I think, for, for the sake of journalism. But I'm not... I don't, again, like I said, I'm not a journalist here. And I think, you know, really the key, the critical factor is trust among the folks that, that appear in the film because it is ultimately their story. And so I offer all of our interview subjects, I mean, you know, for the ones that I, I think maybe are, are skeptical or, you know, one of the, the, one of the couples that we interviewed for this new film, they had just recently, when I showed up, they had just recently participated in this reality TV show, there were, it was something I forget, I don't know what show it was exactly, but the way they described it to me was, you know, it was looking at uh, families or, or couples that, that uh, are farmers. And as any reality TV show is going to do, they're going to look for the conflict, you know, and try to, um, to make more out of something than it was so that they can get better ratings or more, more viewers. So they, they had felt a little bit burned 
Um, and they told me, you know, we were just in this sh- in the show. You know, we thought they were going to want to know about our, uh, you know, how we're doing cover cropping to make a living and, and how we're transforming our farming operation and some of the other concerns that we have. The only thing they, they really wanted to focus on when the when the show was edited was what they blew up to be a conflict between husband and wife. Um, it wasn't really a conflict between them. I think it was like one day where they, they had like some disagreement about, you know, what should they do first? Should they like fix the tractor? Or should they like, you know, get out in the field and start the wheat harvest? It was something, you know, a husband and a wife that work together are always going to have, I mean, you, you got to have a strong marriage just to do that to begin with. But there's no surprise that there's going to be some kind of disagreement at some point. And the way these reality TV show producers made it seem was like their marriage was on the verge of implosion and they had daggers out for each other. and you know, They cued their dramatic music. And, you know, when, when there's disingenuous uh, storytelling, it's out there like that. That's driven by a profit and it's driven by ratings. It makes my job much harder. You know, you know, someone like Michael Moore. I've had people say to me, like, you're not going to pull a Michael Moore on me, are you? <laughs> you know, and, you know, I have, I have mixed feelings about Michael Moore. I think he's told some really good stories, but I also think some of his process is, is disingenuous the way he ambushes people and, and maybe makes them look stupid so that the audience can have a little snicker about that. Um, you know, I think when when you start putting people down and making them look stupid, uh, you know, you you're not going to work. You know that, that old saying in Hollywood, like you'll never work in this town again. I mean, because my work is designed to, at least my intention is to transcend political barriers or cultural barriers. If I start mocking people and making them look stupid, um, I, I'll lose that that. That, that brand, so to speak, you know, or, um, you know, the thing that I think makes our work at American Resilience Project unique and special. Um, you know, when I film folks in the military, um, they're hypersensitive about um, making sure they don't get in trouble saying the wrong thing on camera. I've offered them the opportunity to look at the footage uh, before I release it. They, I've never had anyone, I've done a lot of military interviews, I've never had anyone's protest because the only story that I'm trying to highlight is what I think is the good news story. And I'm trying to highlight how the military is trying to save lives and money by embracing a new technology. So I'm not going to do anything to make them look bad um, because then it defeats my own agenda <laughs> to to try to uh, find harmony and and consensus around some of these stories. So, you know, I think respecting people, um, having a lot of humility, um, don't go in there with assumptions, or if you do have assumptions, you have to acknowledge what they are and be prepared to to reverse them or or uh, abandon them, um, you know, and give folks a, a participatory uh, role in the storytelling process. So, talk to us a little bit about the American Resilience Project. Um, how did that come about, and what's your elevator speech? Hmm. So it's a nonprofit. Um, we are, you know, what I like to say, we make mission-driven films that are designed to, as you, you mentioned in the opening, to strengthen civilizational security and uh, overcome the challenges that humanity faces. And I, I, I realize that might sound a little grandiose. Um, I also know that just by making a film, we're suddenly not going to solve all of the, the world's problems. But I think that that starting with a good narrative is is really critical. Um, you know, we have to know what our story is. I, and I actually, I borrow this term strategic narrative from a, a military strategist who actually was, uh, who wrote it as part of a paper for the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, several years ago. The paper was called The New National Strategic Narrative. And they said that, you know, one thing we're missing in our national security uh, strategy is a good narrative. We've got a lot of operational tactical plans um, you know, we know how to do a lot of, uh, of really f- in, in amazing work here as a, as a fighting force. But there is sometimes a disconnect when if you ask the, you know, the lowest person in the ranks, you know, the soldier on the front lines, why are you fighting? Why are you doing this? Um, uh, the good answer is, is not, well, because my commanding officer told me to. You know, there's a certain, you know, I'm not, I'm not a military uh expert or, you know, military science or military strategy expert, but 
there is a uh, something about the willingness to fight and the will to fight that is assessed by uh, by military strategists, and if they they determine that you know uh, you know they're going to attack somewhere or they're going to defend against a, an invading force. It, it, they want to measure the will of that that force to fight, and if you don't have a good narrative that that everyone along through the ranks can all say, you know, like in World War II, you could go to the front lines and you go to the commanding generals in Washington. Everybody knew, you know, we're fighting for freedom and against fascism. Um, that that was the that was the strategic narrative that brought them all together. They could all relate to that, um, and uh, we don't. It's, it's hard to identify what's what is the reason that we're, you know, why were we in Afghanistan? Why were we in Iraq? It got a little muddy. Um, it was hard to, to have a, a unifying narrative there. And so what our work at American Resilience Project is designed to do is to create some of these these common narratives that, that people from different walks of life can can understand. You know, we're all we, we may have different values. We may have different views. Um, you know, some of us might think the government is too intrusive. Others might think we need more government action on, on, on something else. But, you know, we all come back to this. We all want to take care of our families. We all want our homes to be secure. We all want a stable food supply. So we, we try to create films that, um, that, that, that really rise above the, the political back and forth of the day. You know, we, we're looking at transitions to electric vehicles. How do we close coal plants and coal communities without disrupting uh, the livelihoods of the people that work at those plants and the surrounding communities. You know, we focus a lot on workforces and, and, and the human face behind those jobs. Um, you know, how the, the, the clean water issues affect the people. It, it all comes back to people for us. And so, um, you know, when I started making these films, I was trying to raise money as a filmmaker and I found a lot of foundations and philanthropists would stop me in the beginning of my pitch and say, I'm sorry, you know, we don't do films. And for me, that was sort of like saying, well, you know, we don't do words um, because for me, a film is just a tool to achieve an objective. I don't measure the success of our work um, on whether or not we actually created or completed a film. I, when we make the film, that's when a lot of the work then begins. It's okay. We've created a tool. Now is when the hard work starts. How do we use this tool to convene people um, and uh, and really achieve either policy change or cultural change or behavioral change uh, or or even just pl provide political cover to people who maybe haven't had a way into the conversation, but now we're giving them a good story that they can tell to their shareholders or to their constituents. Um, or to their neighbors so that they uh, can bring other people along with them. So it, it seemed like a smart decision to create the organization as a nonprofit. So now when I go to funders, I don't start, I mean, unless they're very into film, I generally don't start with, will you please help us raise money to, to make a film? It's, will you please help us raise money so that we can um, achieve and so we can accelerate and navigate this transition away from coal to renewables or from gas powered cars to electric cars or how to, or help us achieve these goals of improving food security and, uh, you know, helping farmers stay on the land or pass their land on to their, their, their kids. And then when we get in some interest, they'll say, oh, wow, that's great. I'm glad those are your goals. How do you intend to do that? Then we say, well, what we do is we tell stories. We make films and we make communications tools, and curriculum materials, and we do mock debates and simulated town hall exercises. And then, then we, uh, we tend to get more interest because people see that we're mission oriented and we, we're goals oriented uh, and that the film really is just a tool to achieve those goals. So, so we here at Discovery Park are all about light bulb moments uh, where you're inspired. What, what's been your biggest light bulb moment so far in all the films you've worked on? Oh, boy. Good question. Um, you know, I am always looking for those key phrases, right? Those, those, those frames, like I mentioned before about the, the phrase in that military document, the, uh, the threat multiplier. You know, I'm, I'm looking for, uh, like the title of this new film, Farm Free or Die, um, you know, it, when you look at the poster and you, you look at the, uh, you know, some of the things that, that people are saying, yeah, I mean, there's a lot about, about climate change, but, you know, the theme that we keep coming back to is what is the most unifying phrase that we can, 
we can we can say here. Um, and so for me, the light bulb moment takes takes on the you know always looking for that 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 unifier. Um, you know, one person talked about we want to be able to stay on the land. We can't stay on the land, or we can't get on the land. So when I heard those phrases, those were, were light bulb moments. I, I tried to build some of my conversations and in the interviews around those. So you know, some farmers were talking about uh, you know having a f- uh, hundred year flood every three years. And, and seeing half of their fields wash away, uh, you know. And so the question then became, okay, you keep coming back to this flood is driving you off your land. It's making it harder for you to stay on the land. What can we do to help you stay on the land in light of the 100-year the flood, uh, rather than just focusing on the rhetoric around climate change and environmental change? Um, you know, it's got to keep it focused on the people. So so for me, it, I think that that along the way was, um, the the recurring light bulb moment is just always looking for the connection to people and their well being, and it you know the only way you're going to get buy in is if you keep coming back to that, um, you know because you know we have you know we're a pretty diverse crowd in this film I and mean, we've got um, you know some pretty conservative farmers and we also have some what I'd say some you know pretty progressive. Um, uh, you know, dare I use the word hippie <laughs> farmer, um, you know, what brings them together? A love for the land, a love to provide food for people. Um, they have more in common than the, the polarized media ecosystem would suggest. And we see ourselves as somewhat of an antidote to that. You know, we're, we're pushing against that and saying, you know, don't, don't highlight the things that, that divide us here. Um, we, we know that we're different. Right? We're not trying to make everybody to be the same, um, but you know we can all get along a lot better if we see where our connecting points are. So, you know that's that's it for me. I'm, I'm always, that's for me the light that, that I'm always looking for. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, I want to unpack farm free or die a little bit more. The West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center in Brownsville, Tennessee at exit 56 off I-40 offers an authentic Southern experience showcasing the history and culture of rural West Tennessee. Inside, visitors can learn about the history of cotton, explore the scenic and wild Hatchie River, and get to know the legendary musicians who call West Tennessee home. Also located on the grounds is Flag Grove School, the childhood school of Tina Turner, and the last home of blues pioneer Sleepy John Estes. To learn more about the center, visit westtnheritage.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe rate and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Roger Sorkin, a filmmaker and nonprofit founder. We've been discussing uh, his most recent film, Farm Free or Die. Uh, what was the genesis of this particular documentary? So, you know, our organization is really focused on trying to address some of these environmental challenges that, that we're facing right now. Uh, and I make a distinction between environmental challenge and climate challenge. because not, not all environmental challenges are climate related. You know, we've got, we've got uh, earthquakes and we've got land subsidence that's exacerbating coastal flooding. And those things don't have anything to do with, you know, how much uh, green greenhouse gas is up in the atmosphere. Um, you know, public health issues, whatever, whatever is out there that's, that's affecting, uh, you know our ability as, as human beings to make a make a, a comfortable, peaceful living on this planet. Um, and it came to my attention that you know farmers are are just you know it's always been a tough profession. Um, but what's become more difficult over uh, the past uh, couple of decades is the unpredictability of weather. Um, you know whether you believe that this weather is caused by um, you know, human caused climate change or not, the fact is the weather is more unpredictable. I mean, you can't deny that at all. Um, and I started at that point to see what can we do to help farmers, um, you know, understanding that they were all affected by this fact that our, our food security is ultimately going to be on the line 
uh, if we don't take care of our farmers. So there is something that's in it. You know, I try to think of the most cynical person in the audience who's going to, when the lights come on after the movie, they're going to say, well, yeah, but what's in it for me? Well, my answer is your food. Uh, so, so, you know, even if you don't care about other people, um, your food, the prices for your food, food supply that you have to deal with, um, or that you have access to is, is a factor here. And so I do personally believe that, that, uh, climate change is a huge problem and that it is making this, the, these weather patterns more, uh, more volatile and farmers are on the front lines and looking at some of the, the ways that they can insulate themselves against these uh, these these challenges, uh, regenerative agriculture came up in, uh, in conversation, and um, the 2023 Farm Bill came up. And so for me, it seemed like okay, this is a really good opportunity to take the 2023 Farm Bill, try to incentivize some of these regenerative agricultural practices, so that farmers can can make a better living, uh, so that they can actually uh, improve problems like soil erosion. Um, and pests and uh, some of the other volatility that, it, that they're experiencing now that, you know, they used to know, they used to be able to say, you know, first week in April, I can always expect, you know, a rain, you know, good, you know, this amount of rain or, you know, so it always rains this much in April. Um, now it's, it's hard to predict, to predict that stuff. And so um, we wanted to, to explore the intersection between generative agriculture improving farming, farming livelihoods, uh, and, and public policy. And we had folks in the film, you know, one of the farmers in uh, Humboldt, Tennessee, he said, uh, you know, asking for government help and having the government come in, uh, to do anything for us goes against every fiber of my being. However, um, we really need some help in this case, you know, for, for us to do regenerative agriculture and for us to have an incentive to do regenerative agriculture, um, we need the government to come in and set up some guideposts so that we know how much money we can make if we are going to use regenerative agriculture to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. And that, for me, really was what I thought was a really interesting story. In that, you know, we we have we don't have the technology right now, man-made technology, to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. We're, we're at the mercy of our natural systems, you know, whether that's uh, wetlands or forestry or agriculture. And we know that the soil can capture, uh, you know, global soils can capture up to 20%, at least 20% of the atmospheric carbon that we need to, uh, to deal with uh, catastrophic climate change. And, um, you know, farmers get it. You know, even if they're on the fence about whether or not climate change is is caused by humans or if it's just a natural cycle, they know that the Earth is heating up. They know that that the weather patterns are are just wild right now, uh, and that if we can make money off of sequestering carbon uh, from, from the atmosphere and putting it in the soil, that's going to help farmers with uh, improving their yields. Um, it's going to deal help deal with erosion, um, and. Uh, it's going to help them reduce the number of inputs in terms of fertilizers and other chemicals that they need to put on their land and then be exposed to uh, so their own health can improve. So there's so many overlapping wins here that uh, it seemed like a really good story to tell to, to try to, to bring in folks uh, you know, across the political and cultural spectrum, rural to urban, to, uh, to advocate for a generative agriculture policy in the 2023 Farm Bill. Well, and do me a favor for those who are listening who don't know exactly what that is. Can you define regenerative agriculture for us? So regenerative agriculture is, uh, you know, the, the aspirational, uh, the ultimate aspiration for regenerative agriculture is a closed loop system where whatever we, we emit, we put back in. Uh, so, you know, if we're, if we're putting carbon into the atmosphere we're putting that carbon back into the plants. Um, you know, it, we don't want to have to uh, uh, keep on putting uh, man-made fertilizers and chemicals into soil. Uh, it's not a renewable resource, um, you know, those fertilizers, that is. Um, so, you know, to, re to literally regenerate the land by farming it. Um, you know, there's a lot of practices that, that, that can be done to, uh, to improve soil quality, um, like cover cropping, for example, that's that's probably the top regenerative agriculture process uh, that that is easy to do, doesn't cost a lot. Um, it, it, there's really no downside whatsoever. Um, you know, when you put when you harvest your cash crop, 
you know, you harvest your cotton or your wheat or your soybeans, um, follow that harvest with a cover crop. Uh, it's going to help uh, regenerate the nutrients in the soil, uh, the microorganisms in the soil. Um, it is going to uh, cool the soil a little bit more, create uh, more moisture retention. Um, so, uh, it, you know, and then, and then when it comes time to plant your cash crop again, uh, the following season, you just plant right into those cover crops. It becomes a mulch. Uh, the nutrients in those cover crops go right back into the soil. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's working towards a closed loop system that uh, regenerative agri agriculture is really good for. Of course, we have uh, the new permanent exhibit here at Discovery Park, um, Agriculture with a capital C, uh, Innovating for Our Survival, which ties in very nicely. And that was sort of our aha moment, our light bulb moment when uh, someone said, you know, we've got to innovate for our survival. And we were like, aha, that's the, that's the name of the exhibit. So this is a nice tie-in. Um, we worked uh, in some ways uh, in different aspects with Glad Castellaw um, on the exhibit. I know that you worked with him on the film. How did you uh, come across uh, Glad? Yeah, so I actually came across Glad when he was just retiring from the Marines. Uh, he was uh, retired as a three-star general um, and uh, was focused – you know, really understood this intersection between climate and environmental security and our national security. And uh, I, my, one of my previous films looked at the uh, problems of, of uh, coastal flooding in the Hampton Roads region of Virginia, which is the largest concentration of military installations that we have in the, in the world, really. It's our largest naval base. Uh, Norfolk Naval Station is there. Um, that's just, uh, one in six people in that region have something to do with the military, uh, whether they're active duty or retired or married or their, their family members, uh, are, are service members. And, uh, the, the readiness on those bases is challenged because of, uh, of sea level rise. Um, I'd mentioned land subsidence before that as well, which is not, you know, you can say sea level rise is, is climate related, uh, human caused climate change related, um, you know, as we melt ice and because the atmosphere is warming, the sea level is going to rise. Well, you know, land subsidence is a natural occurrence. So even if you don't believe in climate change and you don't think sea level rise is a problem, um, you know, the land is sinking. So that means the water is going to come in anyway. And so you've got these runways at the air force bases and some of these amphibious training facilities for the Marines. Uh, the army, they are, uh, they're challenged with more water than they ever had. You've got roads where service members can't get to the base, even on sunny days, sometimes when there's high tide, uh, because that much more water is coming in. So I met General Castellaw, uh when he was just wrapping up his military service. We served on a couple of panels together to talk about the connection between climate and, uh, and security. Uh, and then he told me that he was going back to the farm in Tennessee and starting up a precision agriculture company called FarmSpace, uh, which uh, does mapping and drone and imagery work uh, over farmland, um, helps farmers make important decisions about what kind of inputs they need to put into their land. Of course, he would be able to tell you much better about what the company does. But my understanding is with the technology that they have, which, by the way, he first became aware of when he was in the Marine Corps. Um, was then able to take that technology and apply it to the civilian space uh, so that farmers can get a better read on what their, their fields need and then can spend their money more wisely, spend their time more wisely on how much input they actually uh, put into that land. Well, I'm no scientist, but I know that he does cool stuff with drones too. Yeah, I think that's how they do most of their work. I mean, it's a lot of, uh, and it's not just, you know, we filmed them doing some of their, they're in the film and, and we have this team um, operating the drones and, and uh, teaching high school kids how to use them to uh, present them with career opportunities in ag tech, which is a really interesting new field. I mean, I would encourage anybody who's listening here, um, you know, the high school kids, uh, think about that. I mean, you know, this is not your... Uh, this is not your grandfather's farming career. I mean, you're, you're using some seriously high-tech equipment. You need to have uh, knowledge in computers, um, you know, IT, electronics. You know, the more knowledge you have in that space, uh, the more opportunities there are going to be to get to do, do some kind of ag tech career. Um, 
so uh, yeah, and I'm no scientist either, but uh, yeah, they're they're flying over fields. They're they have all kinds of sensors. They can measure how much carbon is in the soil, how much nitrogen or phosphorus, and then and then make those decisions uh, for the you know for the the next week or month or or season as to how much fertilizer you're going to need and how much time you're going to need to spend tending to your field. And they will be here for Ag Day, uh, talking to young folks about agriculture, um, along with a lot of other people. And we'll be uh, premiering Farm Free or Die here that day as well. We're excited about that. Before we go, um, Discovery Park of America's mission is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. So I always like to ask our guests, what inspires you? Uh, What inspires me is the capacity of the human mind to do really amazing things. Um, I'm somewhat of a, a blend of an optimist and a cynic, um, you know, a cynic in the sense that I think, you know, to really inspire people, sometimes you have to show them what's in it for them. Um, but once you can show that to them, you know, I come back to, again, that basic human need, you know, how are you going to improve uh, your own livelihood or the lives of the people that you love, uh, the neighborhood that, that you live in, um, and, uh, I'm an optimist because I, I really, uh, I'm, I'm amazed at, at what human beings have been able to done in the, the short, uh, you know, several hundred thousand year time span that we've had on this, on this planet. Uh, it, it's amazing. And I want to see it continue. So, so, uh, you know, I'm a big believer in the human capacity for technological innovation, but even just cooperation. Um, you know, we've done it before and we can do it again, uh, as long as we can, you know, get beyond the fact that, uh, you know, we are, we have more in common than, than, uh, you know, folks out there in the media and in politics want to, uh, want us to believe that we have in common. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. I cannot wait uh, to watch the, the film. Well, thank you, Scott. It's an honor to be with you and, uh, really appreciate your good work. And thanks to all of you listeners who've joined Roger, Emily, Luke, and me today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. <laughs>